Whether you know them as the Children of Chaos, the Cloven Ones, or simply as the Beastmen, this race of furry goat people and overly angry cowmen represents the corrupting influence of the Warp in its truest form. A race of orphaned mutants and depraved savages who exist solely to feed, to kill, and to tear down civilization brick by brick, and trample it beneath their hooves. They were officially released as a playable faction for the Warhammer trilogy more than two years ago, in one of the more divisive Total War content updates in recent memory, with an undeniable charm about them. A full army of glass cannon, lightning fast guerrilla raiders who strike from the shadows, and ambush from the forest to feast and pillage, then melt back into darkness before they can be challenged. I think many of us can agree, Minotaur charges and their gory aftermath are amongst the most satisfying things to watch in the history of Total War, and they're a micro-intensive, rewarding faction that is an absolute blast to control on the battlefield. And they're good, especially from a multiplayer perspective, they can compete with the best and come out on top in the current meta. But despite all the fantastic work that went into them, they remain the worst race or campaign pack Creative Assembly have ever released for the Total War Warhammer series. By far, the least reflective and least complete of any of the DLC races 8th edition army books, by far the most damaged by their missing units on launch day, and a race that has continued to become more and more overshadowed, as many of the things that initially made them unique were gifted to others as well, where many of their campaign mechanics weren't even unique in the first place. Their Eye of Morselib Dark Moon events were gifted to the Stunty White Dwarf, their Bestial Rage Meter and Bray Herds were the same as Greenskin Waz on launch day, and their ambush and beast pass dances have been used over and over and over again, from Alifanar to the Skaven to everything in between. And a big reason for these things is because they were simply a victim of timing. A victim of being the first experiment in a new setting where developers hadn't had the time to learn and grow and ultimately nail the content the community wanted. And a victim of being the redheaded stepchildren of Games Workshop, of course, for so many years, just as they were in the lore completely overshadowed by the big burly armored tanks of chaos and the colorful and frequently overpowered demonic forces of earlier editions. It was during the release of the Call of the Beastmen that the hype behind mini campaigns started to die off, when people realized they weren't particularly story driven or interesting, that they kind of artificially inflated in price, and when people really started putting their foot down and demanding more fleshed out unit rosters. And in many ways, the mistakes Creative Assembly made with the Beastmen in one of their first forays into the setting set the stage for all those amazing successes that would come later, with Norska, with the Wood Elves, and especially with the Tomb Kings, where they had the time to take feedback on board and into account and really tailor those packs to what we expected as consumers. But while there have certainly been improvements over the years since launch, from the release of Morgur and the Harpies, to new start positions, and the absolutely hilarious minus 4% recruitment cost reduction Bestigore rework for Kazrak, the Beastmen are still in a similar position to much of the early Game 1 cast, in need of quite the overhaul to bring them up to Game 2 standards. But given Game 3's heavy emphasis on demons and a likely rework of the Warriors of Chaos, saving their makeover till 2019 might be very logical. Whenever CA decides to do it, and whatever it is, by far the biggest issue facing the Beastmen is their unit roster. Take a second to compare them to a race like the Tomb Kings, who came out a year and a half later. For the same price, both currently retailing at $18.99 on Steam, the Tomb Kings get an additional legendary lord, much more interesting star positions that span more than half the globe, and a completely fleshed out unit roster, almost a perfect one-to-one -one translation directly from the source material. We can quibble about heroes in a melee variant of the Bone Giant all we want, but I've always been a fan of both form and function, and with the Hyro Titan, Bo of the Desert Bone Giant and Cambrian War Sphinx having that same role covered, and in much cooler ways, the fact that it's not in means very little to me. Pick your battles on that front. But on top of a fantastic unit roster, they also have some really engaging and unique mechanics, armies free of upkeep but limited to the Dynasty system, the Mortuary Cult, the books of Nagash, and beautiful cutscenes that tell a story and immerse us further in the setting. So while the Tomb Kings are a triumph and an absolutely amazing DLC in pretty much every measurable way, the Beastmen are missing their 4th Legendary Lord, a huge percentage of their 8th edition army book, and unique campaign mechanics that truly differentiate them from the rest of the pack. The gulf in quality for the same price is actually pretty enormous, so I want to talk about how to fix that. As with my Empire video, we'll pluck the low-hanging fruit first. Why in Nurgle's pestilent glory, in Slanesh's perverse glory, 
are Doom Bowls still not a thing? This is by far one of the most bizarre aspects of the missing content in Call of the Beastmen, period. CA and lots of other developers love reskins, and that's not a bad thing. Like, if you're gonna put the time, effort, and energy into making an asset, why not reuse it wherever it makes sense, right? So, why are there still no Minotaur Lords? Monstrous Lord types are without question amongst the most impressive elements of Warhammer Fantasy setting, period. And Minotaurs are some of the coolest units CA have ever done. And they're well aware that their fan base likes thematics and that they love lore themed army builds. So, why Gorbals weren't copy pasted into the Lord category given the Eat Trend, Clen Hard, Anavar Give Up, Swole Treatment, and uh, basically just a big facelift on their skill tree? I have no idea. Like, it fills a role that they're actually lacking in their roster a hard hitting, armor piercing, anti large Lord who can deal with the big daddy dino spam and dragon threats that are so prevalent in game 2 rosters. Doom Bulls are hands down one of the coolest generic lord types in the setting, and the Beastmen roster is lesser for not having them. So this is something that would be easy to implement and be a really big boon for their roster overall. And along the same lines, I think Gore Bulls need a mass increase. This is something that's been a problem since game 1, but they get tossed around like ragdolls by things that are way less swole. I mean sure, a Star Dragon, a Hell Pit Abomination, a Hydra, those things likely have the strength to knock them around a bit, but when trolls are sending them flying, or little bumps from that nerdy cauldron of blood, that's not really okay. Much like dismounted lords like Ungrim and Grimgore, they need some kind of knockdown resistance so they don't get constantly bullied by things that have no business bullying them. They're a 2,000 pound slab of rock hard flank steak that also happens to be a carnivore. You're not moving that thing very easy, so seeing them get tossed around left and right, they're kind of immersion breaking. And Minotaur pricing overall is busted as hell right now. Their stats are fine, their playstyle is awesome, but their pricing absolutely makes no sense in comparison to other monstrous infantry like Fimir. Seriously, take a look at these stats right now and ask yourself why they have to be paying 200 extra gold on each of their variants despite having nowhere near the survivability or resistance to missile fire that Fimir do. That is power creep in a nutshell. And don't misunderstand, Minotaurs should be susceptible to missile fire. They are meant to be glass cannon units, but right now they have to pay an exorbitant price for a stat line that doesn't exactly blow other monstrous infantry out of the water. And until their pricing has changed, they're going to remain a very niche pick in competitive multiplayer, which is a bit of a shame because it's by far the coolest unit in their roster right now. In campaign, obviously a different story. AI will rarely punish their low armor effectively, and recruitment cost is simply less relevant there, so they're amazing in a campaign setting. When you've got a full stack of them, they can run over the planet, but they could use some tweaks in MP for sure, and they should be able to hide as well. It defeats the purpose of an ambush faction when their monsters can't actually ambush. They're not much bigger than demigriffs or fully armored knights on fully armored horses. They definitely know how to sneak alongside the rest of their army, let them hide in forest. Right now they can't, it's silly that they can't. They're minotaurs, they're not a T-Rex, like they can hide. And for a fourth legendary lord, there can only be one, and my vote will obviously go to Torox the Brass Bull. He's a doom bull, blessed by Korn himself, with a pure body made of brass, but punished for killing one of his dark emissaries, with a small spot on his throat that isn't quite covered by living metal. So, if somebody managed to stab that part, he would die, and he would die hard. That's exactly what Hunts Marshal Marcus Wolfhart does in the end times, plants an arrow right in that spot on his neck and drops him with a well-placed shot. Torox has a crazy stat line as you might imagine, a huge armor value, and is basically just a juggernaut of a killing machine. I mean, he is a true world beater that the Beastmen severely lack in the Lord category right now. None of their Lords are the kind of dude who can wade into melee and just slaughter everything. And again, not a particularly difficult model for CA to create either. Heavy emphasis on Gorbals and Minotaurs, which a lot of people love playing with anyway, would make him a really fun campaign, and you could plop him pretty much anywhere on the planet and say he's questing for his rune tortured axes. So I think he checks all the boxes of a character people would want to play with, and he looks badass. He's sweet. I mean, he's a perfect candidate for their fourth lord. And for the existing lords, it's never gonna happen, but Malagor should fly, I've talked about it before, 
or at the very least, he should be super fast on foot. There are still quite a few characters like Valkyrie the Bloody and Kairos Fateweaver who fly in the lore and in the tabletop, and it just seems wrong to continuously forgo that element of their characters and what makes them unique. Allowing the Dark Omen to actually use his wings for once would really make him unique in the way that he should have been from the start, and I wouldn't mind if he got a few extra bound spells as well, from the Lore of Shadows, the Lore of Beasts, or the Lore of Death, doesn't really matter, he has access to all those on the tabletop. He's an incredibly proficient caster of more than just the Lore of Wilds, as you might expect from the literal Herald of Mankind's Doom. So the fact that he only has access to that one lore doesn't really sit that well with me. Kazrat could use some love as well, obviously. He just feels kind of underwhelming and generic in both campaign and multiplayer. And I think more could be done with him to stress his cunning and his ability to actually outmaneuver opponents on the strategic map and the battlefield itself. His focus on Bestigors is nice, but for some unknown reason, they are still three turn recruitment. Again, doesn't make any sense. Without a doubt, one of the most bizarre holdovers from 2016, there is simply no reason they should ever have taken that long to recruit from the start, and the fact that it's still happening in 2018 is even more bizarre. Like, there's no reason the Beastmen should ever have to stand still for that long, because it is the complete antithesis of Beastmen play. Not only is it illogical, it's boring. You literally have to spam end turn three times just to recruit a handful of heavy infantry. Like, good luck having fun with that if you don't have an SSD, but we've been complaining about it since launch, and it's time to get fixed. It makes no sense. Best score should be two turns at most, but frankly, they're probably not even worth that. It should probably just be one turn recruitment. There's nothing incredibly special about them. They're armor piercing, but there's plenty of other armor piercing on their roster as well. But I do want to talk about the unit roster itself for a second. You guys know the drill here. It's been talked about many times before, but it has to be stressed because it would almost single-handedly bring the Beastmen up a tier or two in terms of how awesome they are. Give us the Gorgon, please. CA. Please. Gorgon. Please. I mean, it's just so beautiful. It's that centerpiece unit, that eye-catching monstrosity they've been lacking since the beginning. The Beastmen Giant has always been a massive disappointment from day one. It doesn't synergize with the rest of the roster in any way, shape, or form. It is super slow, it doesn't look cool, it doesn't play differently than any other giant, there's nothing unique about it at all. Look at the Wood Elves, they have Tree Man and Tree Kin and Forest Dragons, and the Tomb Kings have all their Construct units and tons of monster variety, but the Beastmen are lacking the Gorgon, which would synergize exceptionally well with their playstyle, which is fast, it's hard hitting, it's terrifying to behold, and it's subject to many of the special rules that make Beastmen what they are. Frenzy, immune to Psych, Blood Greed, and it has a much cooler model than yet another vanilla ass white bread giant that nobody wants to see. On the tabletop, it regenerates while it's in combat and feasting on enemies, and it functions more like a huge speedy single entity minotaur with regen than a typical slow giant. If the Gorgon and Doombull were added, I would honestly consider the Beastman roster done and dusted. I think those are by far the two most logical and most important additions CA can make. The inclusion of stuff like a Praetin or a Jabberslife isn't important to me at all, and aesthetically they don't quite fit in the same way a Gorgon does, but with that said, I certainly wouldn't say no to them, I'd still be happy if they got added, and for the sake of funsies here, we can probably quickly cover them and talk about what they would bring to the table if they ever got added, and CA decided to pony up them Charlemagnes. You guys know it well, the Jabberslife, it's a pretty divisive unit, it's one of the dankest memes I've ever seen from the Total War community, and it has one of the ugliest ass models Games Workshop have ever made. Ever. And that's saying a lot, because they've made some pretty ugly ones. But as a flying, terror-causing, bulbous freak, it doesn't really fit the goat, cow, or herd animal aesthetic turn vicious predator theme the rest of the unit roster sports, but it does have some pretty crazy special rules, and I think it would be a lot of fun to play with. In the lore, they're so ugly and so terrifying, that they literally cause people to turn insane just by being in close proximity. This aura of madness functions like a mortis engine, as nearby enemies like will claw out their eyes or babble gibberish as they gut themselves with their own weapons. So basically an HP drain over time whenever it's engaged in melee. And it has a shooting attack as well, a retractable tongue that you see very nicely on the front there that will pull victims into its gaping maw, and spurting bile blood that randomly deals damage when it's being attacked. 
So it would be an incredibly unique and fun unit. But I think it's pretty clear CA weren't lying when they said it would be very difficult and very expensive to make and animate. And for a unit that fits a bit questionably into the Beastman aesthetic and theme, I can see why they didn't bother. And I think everybody knows at this point, but no, we're probably never going to get a Jabra's Life. And I'm personally okay with that, but I know why people want it. The Praten is another interesting one based on creatures that were referenced, I think back in like medieval times that combines bat, lion, and predatory stag all into one really pretty monstrous flying package. They only have rules in the Monstrous Arcanum, I believe. It's a supplement that we've covered before, but we already got a bunch of that stuff actually from Norska. A lot of the things like the Femir Balefiend and the Femir in general were pulled from that Monstrous Arcanum. So, well, not initially. I think Femir were actually even further back than that. They were really, really early edition, but a lot of the monsters that were in that got transported over. But either way, the lore for them is actually pretty interesting. They were born from the Beastmen's rivalry with the Wood Elves, where great stags were captured and basically twisted by Bray Shamans in these horrific rituals. And it turned them into these very hateful, very evil, very terrifying beasts. And they have a really solid stat line for a flying monster. They have scaly skin, so they can resist missile fire pretty well. They have vanguard, flying obviously, and extra move speed when they're on the ground, moving through forest. Its endless malice special rule is kind of a combination of rampage and abyssal howl where it will fail to chase after enemy units sometimes, basically as it savages and rips apart the dead. But any nearby unit will take a huge leadership penalty as they watch their friends get mutilated. So it could kind of work like a net that locks it in place once every, I'm just gonna come up with a random number here, let's say two minutes of combat. But while it's stuck for that 15 or 20 second period, it gets a constant doom and darkness type leadership hex all around it. So that might be an interesting way of balancing out a pretty big downside in terms of losing control of the unit because it'll get stuck into combat, it'll get netted while it quote unquote savages the dead, and then while it's in that state for that 15 seconds, it gets a huge 40 meter uh, leadership X that will lower enemy leadership by like 10 or 12 or some significant number. And it'll have to be significant because if it can't move, that's a big blow to it. So it might be an interesting way to try to balance it out there. And the model would be really cool. Certainly a bit more fitting with the Beastman aesthetic overall, so I like how it looks. I think it'd be fun to play with, but again, not very likely addition. I think it'd be fun though. But shifting away from the inner roster stuff for a second, because obviously not all that's going to get added, there are some elements of their campaign right now that need changing as well. One of the biggest issues they have is their god-awful unit replenishment, which is partially addressed every so often with the Dark Moon events, although you have to give up an entire level of horde growth for those which is frustrating in and of itself and is a problem in and of itself. But I think it'd be really cool if there were unique hearthstones placed around the map, which would naturally serve as areas to retreat to and replenish your numbers. I think more could be done with hearthstones in general. Basically, the higher rank your main general was, the more you could recruit from your recruitment buildings there in those areas as beastmen basically flock to the greatest of their kind and form these huge bray herds around the hearthstones. And if CA wanted to get real fancy, they could make these areas where you could actually recruit special marked beastmen for a very limited time during the Eye of Morslip events. So just like in the lore, you'd be encouraged to migrate towards specific strong points on the map after a Pyrrhic victory or in preparation of a huge invasion, gather your numbers there, then unleash the Bray Herds to conquer the world. I think the possibility of marked beastmen units is also a pretty interesting one. It seems a bit unlikely to me, honestly, as it might detract from what makes the Warriors and Demons of Chaos actually unique, and considering stuff like Zangor's only got models in Age of Sigmar, I'd be surprised if CA took the plunge there, but there is no question that it would add a ton of flavor to the Beastmen race, and it's absolutely true to the source material and some of the earlier editions as well. The Chaos Gods are just as likely to bless Beastmen with mutation as they are warriors or demons, and many of them are marked by the Ruinous Powers. That's why there are plenty of Doom Bulls that are dedicated to the Blood God Korn, there are plenty of herds that are dedicated to Zinch or Sanesh or Nurgle, and that's why things like Pestigors and all these others become marked beastmen in the lore and in the source material. And we've seen it work before too. It's been done very tastefully in mods like Steel Faith Overhaul, where just like marked chaos warriors and demons, they all have their own strengths and their own weaknesses. 
and regular gores and best gores would kind of be the middle ground of them all. Perhaps the most versatile option, but not as tailored to fight specific threats as the marked beastmen, where Zangors would have magical attacks but low health pool, corn gores would be infantry blenders with high melee attack but low defense, pestigors would have regen and a bigger HP pool but be very slow, and salon gores would have armor piercing and very fast move speed, way faster than any of the other variants, but they'd be very squishy with very little armor. But there are some challenging aspects of Beastman campaign that I'm not sure that CA could easily fix, and I do want to talk about those because maybe they'll try addressing them if they can, but I'd like to see them try at least. One thing I've noticed is that a lot of the time, it'll just turn into this game of whack-a-mole, and it turns into a real slog even early on. Like, you'll raise a settlement, the AI will recolonize it immediately, and it doesn't even have to be the same faction. A lot of the time, some random faction will just swoop in right after the turn you raised it and build it up again. And it makes this for this very frustrating slog early on, and definitely in the later stages as well, where you play this mini game of trying to bounce from one city to the next and raise it and keep it raised. And you keep coming back to the same cities over and over again, and it just, it's just not very much fun. You combine that with a kind of slow replenishment, not, not even kind of slow, super slow replenishment rate and the end turn spam where you just kind of sit there without being able to make any moves and it just doesn't make for a very fun playstyle. it's not an enjoyable experience you kind of just end up grinding over and over and i don't know they're just elements like that that i feel like see i need to revisit and try to rework but a lot of these things are kind of inherent problems with the horde mechanic in general and it's something i really think see i need to go back to the drawing board on to make a more fulfilling and entertaining experience from the ground up. The battles themselves save the Beastmen campaign. Like they, they're, they're amazing. Like the Beastmen are super fun to play with on the battlefield itself. But without the glory of Minotaurs, without the glory of their flanking and their vanguard deployments, the whole campaign would have been a dumpster fire long ago. I think there are design elements in there that seriously need rework. And I don't know that they can be reworked very easily. I think they might be too inherent with the whole system. So, I don't know. That's, it's it's difficult, but it's something that I'd like CA to go back and try to fix. Because Chaos is going to be a big focus in Game 3. Beastmen might be as well. Definitely Demons. Definitely Warriors. Some of that's going to have to get addressed for sure. And then, of course, in terms of the Lords themselves, Kazrak, Malagor, and Morgor could all use some more unique skill trees to help them stand out a bit more from the crowd and help enforce that quintessential furry playstyle. And growth could use some tweaking as well because it's hard to get less fun than sitting in camp stance, waiting five turns to get floral punishment after a big battle and watching that horde growth slowly edge upwards. It's just not rewarding or a good way to keep players engaged by spamming end turn five turns in a row. Not good. So yeah, those are my thoughts and suggestions about the Beastmen in Total War Warhammer. I think the core elements that could make them awesome are mostly there, and I dearly love playing with them on the battlefield, but they deserve more toys to play with. Gorgon and Doom Bull at a minimum, actually at a maximum. I'd be 100% fine if both of those got added. I would think that they'd be a complete roster after that, but they deserve updates to their campaign game as well. I mean... I think there are elements of their campaign that significantly need reworking and they deserve another legendary lord to fully bring them up to speed with the rest of the cast and get them in that four legendary lord territory now of course other factions like the wood elves they're only sitting at two they definitely need some more ariel the twilight sisters daith whatever you want to go for there's stuff there for the other factions but we'll address those in another video let me know what you'd like to see for the Beastmen going forward, how you would update them to finally get them up to a good spot, and I will see you all in the next video. Any pride, signing out for now. Have a good one, guys.